Now that song, I belong to the King, I'm a child of His love, and He never forsaketh His own, really uh, contains within its words the theme of of our study. We have been uh, looking at how we are no longer slaves to a couple of uh, different things, to sin. We are no longer slaves to sin because of the gospel. We have been set free, so we are not under law, but under grace. So we have that hope each and every day. Second, we are not slaves to a purposeless life. We described how there is much meaninglessness in the pursuit of of happiness and temporary pleasure, Uh, many of the things in which uh, individuals in our world seek uh, to find meaning within their lives. That These things, in fact, lead to meaninglessness, but because of the gospel, we can have lives that bear fruit, not just now, but even in generations to come. In fact, many of us are the evidence of the faithfulness of a believer from maybe a generation or many generations back who, who was faithfully praying for somebody in your family who came to Christ who then shared it with you, and so on and so forth. Uh, and, and today we're going to look at how we are no longer slaves to fear. And we will uh, find uh, our, our reading today from 1 Samuel chapter seven, 17, which is the story of David and Goliath, which I shared, I think, about a year and a half ago. And we talked about fear, and I really think this is an important chapter, and it's important that we uh, think about how we have been set free. Now, I I know doctrinally, probably all of us would agree we have been set free from sin. We have been set free from a purposeless life, that God has called us to mission. He has called us to love Him, to worship Him, and to share His gospel, to make disciples of all the nations. And we know that intellectually. We know that there is nothing that we should be afraid of, that we have been set free. When we step from this earth, from this life, Uh, that we are set free to enter into His presence, as the song we just sang uh, uh, indicated. But do do we live as though these things are true? If we find our meaning in life to bringing glory to Jesus Christ, that is the purpose for which we have been created, and we ought to make disciples of all the nations, and this is the purpose in which we find uh, our mission, uh, the value of our lives, I would ask, do we faithfully walk in that consistently? Uh, If we are not to be afraid, are are we afraid of the opinions of others? Are we hindered from serving the Lord faithfully in ministry because we are concerned about expressing our gifts that others may look down on us, that people may have differing views on us, that somebody may be able to do something better than us, and so we don't step forward in that, or that serving may cost us something, and so we don't want to walk in that We've been set free from sin, but do we continue to walk in sin? Are you struggling today with a habitual sin, something that you know the gospel, because of what Jesus Christ did, you've been set free from, but yet you continue to live as a slave to those desires, to that work. Uh, Today, I I do want to touch on fear, but I want us to have this, this mindset that because of the gospel, because of what Jesus Christ accomplished for us, We are set free from these things. We are no longer slaves, and so we do not have to live as though we are enslaved to these things. Now, I do ask, what is fear? And I put a definition, I think, in your notes. Uh, Fear is an unpleasant, often strong emotion caused by anticipation or awareness of danger. This is fear. You probably did not have to define this for you. You know what you are afraid of. Uh, some people may be afraid of snakes or of spiders. Uh, some people even ad- may be afraid of, of the dark, or there may be some type of uh, genre of movie that you don't like to see that scares you. Heights are terrifying to many people. Um, there's a reason the Lord kept me this tall. Um, I... <laughs> I'm not a big fan of heights, and that's just uh, that's a fact, uh, and the Lord knows that, so bless Him for what He's done. But, um, but there are things that we, we should be afraid, uh, there are things that we are afraid of, and, and each person today, uh, it might be a fear of a disease or being sick, or a fear of a relationship not going in the direction that we desire to go. And so some of these things we may say are, uh, can be humorous in some ways. Your family may even pick on you for whatever fear you may have. 
that they're aware of. You have a fear of spiders. You might have somebody who puts a plastic spider uh, somewhere hidden away. Uh, and th- those things happen. But, but some fears are, are really significant uh, disease of, of relations that are broken. Uh, our fear of not being found worthy in the presence of the Lord. These are things that cripple people's service for the Lord. And even sometimes their joy in life is hindered because of these fears and because of the circumstances that they go through. Now, I, I do want to address the fact that an awareness, an awareness of danger in and of itself is, is not wrong. In fact, we should have an awareness of danger. The Lord has created us with a sense of when we are at risk. And when we are not aware of that risk, sometimes we can put ourselves in greatly uh, harmful cir- circumstances. I, I want to share with you a story of a, a few years ago, we went to Yellowstone. Has anybody here ever been to Yellowstone? Okay, a couple of hands. Yeah, uh, beautiful, absolutely gorgeous. Now, we decided to do this. We toured Yellowstone in one day, which means we basically you know, just drove through it. And uh, there, there is so much more to see. You really need to, people stay there, even camp there and, and enjoy it all. We got to see many things. One of the things that I, I went into Yellowstone aware of was the danger of the Grand Canyon of Yellowstone. Now, this is what it, it looks like. Now, uh, it's called the Grand Canyon of Yellowstone. It is between 800 and 1,200 feet deep. And so it, it doesn't really look at like that from this angle, but uh, it is 800 to 1,200 feet deep. It is a big, big canyon. The week before we went, uh, a young girl had fallen to her death uh, there. And so we were really concerned, but we thought, surely there is a fence around where people are observing uh, this this valley or th- this um, canyon that there's probably fencing, and this little girl probably climbed around, and parents didn't notice, and she fell. When we got there, we found that there is... No fence. In fact, and this is, this is not my family, this showed up on Google, so I don't know who they are. But um, to me, the Smiths, they are here, and um, there are these big boulders, okay? And on the other side of those is that. It is just a straight drop-off, and there are these boulders, okay? So we went there, and we have this an aw- awareness of danger. And of course, my boys were even littler than they are now. And so we had them in strollers, and they were locked down. And I mean, we're like holding on to them. We're like 25 feet away from the edge. You know, we're not even, and I'd walk up and, okay, I'm good. You know, as I said, not a fan of heights. And, and so there's this. There were families there with little kids, and their kids were running around right in front of these rocks, and then they'd run, and I saw a little boy run and put it, push his foot off one and jump back. And I'm telling you, I almost had a panic attack just watching this kid. And the parents said, nothing. And I'm like, I want to like grab onto this little kid and say, you're not going near this, you know? Uh, but uh, they did not. See, there are things that we should be aware of that posed real danger. And it is okay to acknowledge danger. It is okay to acknowledge when we are threatened. It is okay to acknowledge that there are things that make us uncomfortable. And so today, when we talk about being no longer slaves to fear, I am not saying that you need to beat yourself up if you say, I am uncomfortable doing this. I feel a real sense of danger in my life at different points, and there are circumstances that I am going through that I would not have chosen to go through. And so today, I don't want you to beat yourself up about that or feel like a lesser Christian because you acknowledge danger, because you acknowledge that there's a circumstance in which you find yourself that is unpleasant. But what I want us to see today is that in the midst of the most difficult situation, at a time when all evidence suggests that we are in great risk and danger, even then, we can trust in God because we have a hope that endures not just in our temporary circumstances, but also in eternity to come. Let us go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, as we come to you this morning, Lord, observing uh, this wonderful story of which many of us are, are well aware, Lord, of David's victory over Goliath. Lord, we recognize that in our lives there are obstacles. There are things that we are afraid of. There are minor things. There are significant things. There are obstacles that are hindering us from walking in faith. There are things that we are afraid of that have strained our relationships, perhaps with each other. Lord, we ask that we would see through our circumstances to see you. Lord, that we would not allow ourselves to be hindered by terror, but that we would acknowledge the circumstance and yet choose to press forward in your name. In the name of Jesus, we pray. 
Amen. Now again, if you will turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 17, we will pick up in the third verse in our reading today. It says, The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another in the, with the valley between them. Now this valley of Elah is to the southwest of Jerusalem. It says, the Philist- it says, A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. His height was nine feet nine inches. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 125 pounds. On his legs, he wore bronze greaves with a bronze javelin and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod and his iron point weighed 15 pounds. His shield bearer went ahead of him. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for a battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistine said, This, the Philistine said, this day I defy the armies of the Of Israel, give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Now, David was the son of an Ephratite named Jesse, who was from Bethlehem in Judah. Jesse had eight sons, and in Saul's time, he was very old. Jesse's three oldest sons had followed Saul to the war. His firstborn was Eliab, the second, Abinadab, and the third, Shammah. David was the youngest. And the three oldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to tend his father's sheep at Bethlehem. For 40 days, the Philistine came forward every morning and evening and took his stand. Now Jesse said to his son David, take this ephah of roasted grain and these 10 loaves of bread for your brothers and hurry to their camp. Take along these 10 cheeses to the commander of their unit. See how your brothers are and bring back some assurance from them. They are with Saul and all of the men of Israel in the valley of Elah, fighting against the Philistine. Now, I've always thought that was kind of an interesting phrase. They're lining up for battle, but it doesn't appear there's a lot of fighting going on at this point. Early in the morning, David left the flock in the care of a shepherd, loaded in the care of a shepherd, loaded up, and set out as Jesse had directed. He reached the camp as the army was going out to its battle position, shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistines were drawing up their lines facing each other. David left his things with the keeper of the supplies, ran to the battle lines, and asked his brothers how they were. As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance, and David heard it. Whenever the Israelites saw the man, they all fled from him in great fear." As we have described fear and and what it is, I I want us to ask this morning what fear does. Fear does a few things. The first is that it causes us to overestimate our problems. It says, on hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Now, we can acknowledge the fact that the Israelites were in great danger. Again, Goliath is a really big guy. He is nine feet, nine inches. And he is there, and his armor is, is thick. It is heavy in and of itself. The tip of his, of, his, of his spear is 15 pounds. So this is a terrifying sight. And he's, and he's offering these challenges day after day and, and evening after evening to the Israelites. And he's calling out to them, for them to come out, to send somebody forward to fight him. And as we find in the story, but what we would expect, nobody's willing to say, you know what? That's what I want to do today. I want to go out and fight Goliath. Nobody is going to change their mind on that. I mean, so there is a real danger here. And so we're not diminishing the fact that the Israelites were in danger. And in fact, the the battle between the Israelites and the Philistines was ongoing for generations. The Philistines lived just to the west. They were coastal people. So they lived right on the Mediterranean and they were the westward 
neighbors of Israel. And because of that, they had many conflicts. This Valley of Elah really ran from the Mediterranean all the way into Israel. And so it ended just southwest of Jerusalem. And so this valley is very important, and people are, are battling over it. This is choice ground. And so they have, have known the strength of each other's armies and now the strength of this individual soldier. And so there is real danger. But here we find that they are overestimating their danger. See, they knew that God had given this land into their hands. God had delivered them miraculously many times already. We can recount the times of the judges when the Lord would rise up a judge who would deliver them. Uh, today, Amy is sharing the story of, of Gideon with uh, the junior church below. We know of Gideon. We know of Samson. Uh, we know of Jael. We know of many of these judges of Israel that were raised up to deliver the Israelites any time the surrounding nations came up and attacked them or enslaved them or temporary, uh, temporarily had jurisdiction over them. That this is what would happen. God would deliver them. He had, he had given them powerful examples of his own power and what he was capable of doing. This Philistine was not just calling out he was not just calling out Israel, he was really calling out their God. And he's saying, I am strong enough, I am able to overcome. Our people are to rule over your people. This is, what, this is the authority, this is the power that we have, that I have individually. And so in this moment, they had a chance to say, you know what, God has delivered us so many times before. He has risen up judges, he has delivered us uh, through Moses when he delivered us from the Egyptians. God is not going to allow this giant, no matter how big he is, no matter how successful of a warrior he has been, he is not going to allow us to be servants of, of, of him. God is not going to. And they could have had this kind of faith, but in that moment, they overestimated their problem. Second, uh, fear causes us to underestimate God. As I had just shared they are not even thinking about God's supernatural arm of deliverance or protection. They are in this moment of great difficulty of trial, and rather than seeing God, they see only their problems. And this is something that was a recurring theme for Israel, and is a, current, a recurring theme, I fear, in the lives of many believers, is that we go through different trials and we begin to see only the circumstances right in front of us, whether it is a relational strain, whether it is a health problem, whether it is a financial strain. When we go through life every day, we are thinking about this one obstacle that's in our way rather than focusing on the Lord. Now, God has spoken through the prophet Isaiah, and he had said, I, even I, am he who comforts you. Who are you that you fear mere mortals, human beings who are but grass, that you forget the Lord your maker, who stretches out the heavens and who lays the foundations of the earth, that you live in constant terror every day because of the wrath of the oppressor. So this is several hundred years later, about 400 years later, and Israel still had this kind of issue where they're looking at the surrounding nations around them and, and they are terrified, they are in fear constantly because of the people around them, because of the threat of another nation usurping authority over them. In that moment, they are not seeing God. God spoke through Isaiah and he's saying, I'm God, I'm your maker. I spoke everything into existence and yet you are afraid of people and he calls them grass. We come and we die. And that's the reality. God has the authority to speak people into being. He literally spit the stars out of his mouth, and he says, you are afraid of these people. Why? Why are you afraid of this circumstance? So these are two things that fear does. The third thing that fear does is that it, it strains our, our relationship. Anytime we have an improper view of God, no matter what that improper view of God is, it ultimately manifests itself in an outward expression towards others. Now, continuing this reading, it says, uh, in verse 25, Now the Israelites had been saying, Do you see how this man keeps coming out? He goes out to defy Israel. 
The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt his family from taxes in Israel. Now, being tax-free sounds like a pretty good circumstance. Uh, But David asked the men standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? They repeated to him what they had been saying and told him, this is what will be done for the man who kills him. When Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger at him and asked, why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. And he's saying, you are just thrilled by battle and you are proud and you are wicked in heart and you desire to see people killed you are fascinated by bloodshed this is the kind of thing that is appealing to you this is why you want to hear more stories and why you're eager perhaps even to see somebody else go out and die at the hands of this philistine perhaps that's why you are asking now at this point elia may have a strained relationship with his brother for a number of reasons, but I believe that they all center on an improper view of God. See, God had not chosen Eliab to be the next king of Israel. At this point, God had already anointed that next king, but it wasn't Eliab. And although Eliab is a soldier and he's willing to go out and fight for Israel, the person who is appointed, who has been anointed as the next king of Israel, he's not fighting. In fact, he's tending to sheep. Now, he probably has a pretty significant uh, herd of sheep. I think they're still called a herd at that point. I'm not a farmer, so correct me. But uh, I grew up in town. Uh, But uh, here, Eliab, he says basically, he he looks at his brother David, and he says, see, you're wicked. And what he's doing is, is he's is he's projecting his feelings probably to, that he has about God, God not choosing him. When he was worthy of being the next king, when by all measurements, by all of his, by all of his experiences in life, he is somebody who should be the next king, but his brother has been anointed to be the next king of Israel, and he projects this anger and even this envy at his brother. And he says things that we know are not true. We know that David did not have a wicked heart. Now, David was not sinless. David certainly sinned in many, many profound ways, in fact. We know later on with Bathsheba. And so we don't assume that he was uh, innocent, like he had arrived at sinless perfection or something like that. But he was somebody who did not have a wicked heart. God would later say that he has a, that, that David was a man after his own heart. Uh, we find that in Acts. That this is that David was somebody who desired to worship the Lord and to serve him. But in this moment, Eliab's, Eliab's feelings about God, his view of God, and his, his ability to make the right decisions, his ability to choose the next king, things along those lines, ended up straining his relationship with his brother. And I'm going to be talking uh, throughout this, the service uh, later as we get into the, later when we get deeper into the sermon about how our relationships are, are sometimes strained by an improper view of God when it results in fear. As I said in my opening remarks as well, I think that fear is one of the greatest hindrances towards, from believers faithfully serving the Lord. We are afraid of what our co-workers, of what our relatives may think about us if we share the gospel with them. We are afraid that they'll think of us as a Jesus freak or somebody who is just overly spiritual, somebody who should have a private faith they keep to themselves but is now kind of an oddball. In our culture, when you express your faith publicly, people look down on you for that. And so there's real fear. But it doesn't just happen out there, it happens in here, where people may be afraid of serving the Lord faithfully uh, because of, of how others may view their spiritual gift. There may be somebody here today who's been called to preach who would say, well, I'm afraid of other people. I'm afraid of how they would look at me. Or maybe you've been given a, a gift of singing, and you say, I love to sing, but I, I love to sing praise the Lord. He's given me this great ability, but I would, I'm afraid to sing in front of other people because of the way that they may look at me. Now, we are challenged to move beyond that. These things ultimately, though, are not just a fear of people. It says 
a lot about what we think about God. See, when we are afear, afraid, we are feared. When we are afraid of people, it's, it shows that, that we do not have a proper view of who God is. When we are singing to the, in front of people, when, we are, when I am preaching, I, I'm not doing these things uh, just for you. Now, it is for your benefit, but it's unto the glory of God. When our choir sings, it's not just so they can, this isn't a weekly show off of talent, uh, it is, and they are very gifted, but it is a, a worshiping of the Lord. And so that's what we are called to do. And it's, it's not about other people, it's about God. And if we're not willing to serve God because of other people, then we are not focused on a great big God, we are focused on people. Finally, along those lines, fear gives us excuses for not serving God. Continuing on with the story, David says to his brother in verse 29, Now what have I done? Said David, Can I even speak? He then turned away to someone else and brought up the same matter, and the men answered him as before. What David said was overheard and reported to Saul, and Saul sent for him. David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go up and fight him. So Saul replied, you are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a young man, and he has been a warrior from his youth. Now, as I said the last time I, I preached on this passage or referenced it, David is not a little boy, although in maybe some of our... Uh, I know my kids' Bibles, the children's Bibles, David's always a little kid. And in uh, videos, oftentimes, especially those kid videos, he's trying to put on a coat of armor that's really big, and he's a little boy. David is just not 20 years old, so he's not able to join the army, but he's probably in his upper teens. He has already uh, killed wild animals. He is able to stand out in the fields with his sheep alone. And when he tries on Saul's armor later in the story, it doesn't say that it's too big for him. It says that he is not used to wearing them. And so the implication there is that it, it's quite possible that it even fit. He's just not used to wearing it. But even with that, Saul gives an excuse. There is an excuse for not going up and fighting. Now, I do wonder in this story if anybody else went when Goliath had said, you know, his, his usual challenge, if anybody else one day felt really brave and, and came up to Saul and said, you know what, I'm your man, I'm going to fight. I would like, I'd like to marry your daughter. I would love to be tax-free, I'll tell you that much. And, and they came up to Saul and said that, and he said, you know, you really, he's a really awesome warrior. And they said, you know what, you're right, I'm going to go back to my tent. I wonder if that ever happened. But David here is, is presented... Uh, in front of Saul with his questions that, he've, that he's had and even some of the statements that he has made and now in front of Saul saying, I'll go fight this Philistine. And, and Saul offers this excuse to him. And fear, when we are focused on fear, sometimes the excuses come from others, but sometimes they come from us. You know, I, I will serve the Lord faithfully in this way at some point. When I get past this season of my life, then I, I will serve the Lord in that way. Uh, whenever I overcome this fear of others or of this situation, then I will faithfully serve the Lord in, in this way. Someday I will, share my the, I will share the gospel with my coworkers, with my family, when God gives me the exact cue that I want to hear before I share it. And here there is, there is a, an excuse, and, it, and it's a... It's an accurate excuse on one level, right? David is not a seasoned warrior. He is not even his brother Eliab. He, is, he has not even come up to fight. So there is an excuse here, and there's a measure of truth. There's a degree of truth to what Saul is saying. But David continues to persevere, and he continues to push forward. It says, but David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. David, in this moment, he is not focused on the excuse. Yeah, he's a seasoned warrior. Yes, he is really 
big. Yes, I should be afraid. Yes, there is real danger, but in this moment, I'm not focused on, all, on any of that because I see a God who is really big, and I have no reason to be afraid because he goes before me and he walks alongside me. And so I know that I am going to be delivered from this situation for the glory of God. What I want us to understand today is that we do not have to live as slaves to fear. Maybe today, again, you are in a circumstance that is really difficult. Maybe today you are being tried uh, through something financially, relationally, health-wise, whatever, that is incredibly difficult, and it really is. And so nobody's saying that it isn't. And so there is something really big in front of you. But today I want to encourage you to follow the example that David has shown us to follow, and that is that we do not have to live as slaves to fear. In fact, today, as followers of Jesus Christ, we know that the gospel has set us free from slavery to fear. We are not slaves to fear uh, because the Bible has set, because the gospel has set us free to live for God. If you turn with me, keeping your hand in 1 Samuel 17 and turning to, to Romans chapter 8, we find uh, what the Apostle Paul had, had said about fear and about what we have been called to live uh, like. It says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. What this says is that we are not slaves, we are heirs. We are sons and daughters of the king. And that's what that's, that song we sang, that's what it cried out, that we are heirs of the king. We are, child, we are children of his and his love. He goes before us. If, if we are his, then there is no circumstance, no situation here that should hinder us. There is nothing that should cause us to be so terrified that we do not move forward in worship that we do not go through each day with joy because we know that we are no longer indebted to those things. We do not have to live in fear each day because we can walk by faith. And I want us to see today what faith does in contrast to what fear does and how we ought to walk according to faith. The first thing that faith does is that it it causes us to see a great God for who he is. Looking over at, uh, in the same chapter, verse 31 through 39, it says, What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any against any charge against those whom God has chosen. It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died. More than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? So now he's, he's talking about God. And he's saying nobody condemns us. So we know that if we die, that even in death, we are not removed from our source of joy. Even in death, we are not removed from our source of hope. That even if David were to die at the hands of Goliath, that he was not removed from God's promises. God still had promises awaiting him. There is no defeat there. There is no losing. And he says here that even more than that, we know that, that the Lord, that Jesus himself intercedes on our behalf. So he is advocating our cause before the Father. And it says that we are going to go through difficulties, hardships, dangers. And then, and then the, 
the next line says something. Verse 36 says about a very real danger that the apostle Paul was experiencing and certainly his audience would have been experiencing as well. He says, for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. They had the ever-present possibility of being killed for the, for the sake of Jesus Christ. And he's saying, we could be killed at any moment because we are proclaiming the gospel of Jesus. That is the real danger that we have. Today, you may be going through a circumstance, through a difficult trial, and you might say, this is really difficult, and I really might not make it out of this. My marriage, my relationship with my child, whatever, might not survive the tribulation I'm going through. I might not survive this health risk. I don't know how I'm going to survive this financial burden. That might be you today. And if so, you were echoing the words that the Apostle Paul wrote here. He said, the reality is that we very well may die because we are followers of Jesus Christ. But then he says, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life Neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither heights nor depth, or, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So even if we do not s survive this situation, we are not defeated by it. It has not had victory over us. Even if someday we should die at the hands of, of a tribulation or persecution or a disease, even if something should be the end of the dreams that you had financially, even if that should occur, this is not the end of your hope. In fact, we are more than conquerors because we are not defined by any circumstance. We are defined as children of God. Nothing, nothing can remove God's promises from us and nothing can defeat us because we walk in faith. And because we walk in faith in Jesus Christ, we walk in victory. And when we have this perspective of the trials that we go through, of the obstacles that, in front of, that stand in front of us, even if they are really scary things and really difficult circumstances, when we walk in faith, it causes us to have a diminished view of our problems. It causes us to have a diminished view of our problems. I love the 23rd verse of 1 Samuel 17. In fact, it's my favorite verse even, I prefer it even to when David actually kills Goliath. It says that all the Israelites, all these, these valiant men, they've come up to fight. These are soldiers. I don't think that they are cowards. These are some tough guys, and they have come up to fight. But, but Goliath is really that terrifying. And they come up, and they hear this challenge every morning and every evening, and they choose not to fight. And it says that the words of the Philistine, the champion from Gath, ring forth, and it says, and David heard it. And I love those three lines, and David heard it. You might be in a real trial today, but today you have an opportunity to walk in faith through that, through that darkness, through that difficult situation. See, in this moment, in this moment, David hears it and he sees the threat in front of him and he knows how scary it is and he knows how real the danger is, but it moves right past him and he thinks this is an opportunity to respond in faith. This is an opportunity to glorify God in my flesh. This is an opportunity for me to stand up and for the rest of the Israelite army to look at me and to say, you know what? God is able to do something even through him. And whatever you're going through, God is able to use you as a powerful example for others to look and say, that is what real faith looks like. I can trust God because I see what faith looks like. I see what walking in, fa in faith, walking in victory through faith looks like. I really enjoy this quote. It says, God man do, God's man doing God's will is immortal until God calls him home. That's from George Woodfield, uh, the evangelist in the 1700s. God's man doing God's will is immortal until God calls him 
home. You are called simply to be faithful each day and to walk in victory, seeing not your problems, not focusing every day on them or dwelling on them, being consumed by them, but instead each day to see a God who is great, who is powerful, who is able to deliver you. And you know, if he doesn't choose to deliver you from this circumstance, you still have a hope and you can still have joy because you have joy in eternity to come. And someday he will call each of us home. And when he does, that's in his timing and according to his plan. How good to know, though, that that our lives are in the hands of a God who loves us so much. Finally, today, when we walk in faith, it causes us not to allow the fear of man to demolish our faithful service. David even though there were reasons to be afraid, we, we know the way that the story ends. I, I don't think I have to read the rest of the story for you today. He kills Goliath. He goes out and he, and he walks in faith and he puts himself in danger that God may be glorified. Now, 2 Timothy 1, 6 through 8, Paul wrote to Timothy, his protege in ministry. And Timothy probably had many obstacles to faithful service. He is, a, he is a young minister by the standards of the day. There may have been people who even questioned his authority within their congregation and some other things. And, and he writes to him, and he says that the spirit God gave us does not lead to fear. But, it, but God has given us a spirit that, that we might not... God has given us a spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. That is the spirit that God has given us. We are not called, we do not have to live in fear, certainly not of man. Each day as we walk in in faith in Jesus Christ, as we are empowered by the Holy Spirit, it should express itself in love towards others. We should abound in faith, and and we we should express ourselves not in a timid expression, but joyfully and fearlessly. Today, if God has called you to do something, if God has called you to do something for his namesake, don't allow fear of other people to keep you back, to hinder you. Walk in faith. We serve a great and powerful God. He is able to use you. Dear Heavenly Father, this morning as we have considered your word and we have looked at the example of your servant David, God, we recognize that the circumstances that we may be going through, our obstacles may be quite a bit different than the obstacle that stood in front of David. But God, yet the challenge remains the same. You invite us not to see our circumstance, not to see uh, the danger alone, but God, to, to focus on you. Lord, we worship you and we serve you. The God who is the creator, the only true God, the one who is able to use our lives for his purposes. God, help us not to live in fear each day, in terror, being afraid of how other people may may think. Help us not to be afraid of our circumstances, but God, help us each day to be drawn to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray.